Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today for the latest program in our Read It, See, See It series of lectures connecting Pennsylvania's historic sites with library books near you. Today, we're excited to welcome Joshua, Joshua Roth from the Pennsylvania Lumber Museum. Mr. Roth will give us a presentation on his historic site. Then librarians Kathy Hale and Michael Lear will guide you to further reading and show you some historic books from the State Library's rare collections. The Pennsylvania Lumber Museum is nestled in the wooded mountains of Potter County along gorgeous Route 6 between Gilton and Cowdersport, PA. The museum invites visitors to discover the courageous yet reckless spirit of Pennsylvania's lumbering past while learning to care for the forest of the exhibits in the visitor center. S simulate activities such as swinging an ax, sawing a tree, piloting a log craft, and racing locomotives for a hands-on experience with history. Outdoor exhibits located across the 10-acre campus include a recreated early 20th century lumber camp, a 70-ton shea-geared locomotive, a Barnhart log loader, and a log cabin built by the CCC. The museum's operable steam-powered sawmill is run three times a year at the Spring Show, Bark Peelers Festival, and Fall Show events. And now I'll turn it over to Site Administrator Joshua Roth. All right, thank you very much, Ellen, for that wonderful and concise introduction that exactly uh, uh, exemplifies where we are and who we are. Uh, we are part of the Pennsylvania Historical Museum Commission, a fellow uh, state agency with the, the State Library here. And I'd like to thank Ellen and Kathleen and Michael and Nicole and everyone else that asked us to take part in this. It's uh, very exciting. As I was kind of setting up for those that were coming into the conversation, the museum uh, has a longstanding relationship with our local libraries. Uh, we do offer a uh, pass to all of the libraries within an hour driving radius of the site uh, that acts as a free admission pass to the museum. So uh, if you are a member of one of those libraries, you can go to the library, check out the pass and come over to the museum at no cost. So it's it's a wonderful relationship to have and one we look forward to building uh, and, and strengthening and deepening. Uh, so I'm gonna, as part of the, today's pre presentation, tell you a little bit about the Pennsylvania Lumber Museum and uh, some of the history that we interpret uh, maybe some of you have already visited with us. Uh, if you not, if you have not, we do encourage you to uh, at some point, uh, probably during nicer weather, uh, come and uh, pay us a visit. Uh, as Alan said, we are in Potter County, Pennsylvania, which is in the very northern part of the state. Uh, for those of you that are Harrisburg based, it's probably about three and a half to four hours north. Uh, just head up 15 until you hit Route 6 and then uh, turn left and head west for a bit. And you'll find us, uh, as Ellen said, nestled in the mountains of PA. Uh, we are in a rural community. Uh, Potter County only has about, uh, as this is the count of the last census, about 16 to 17,000 people in the entirety of the county. So it is one of the more rural counties in Pennsylvania. But it's a county and region, uh, you know, several counties around us that were very much shaped by uh, the lumber industry uh, and how it operated around the turn of the 20th century. So I've prepared a uh, PowerPoint presentation. I am going to uh, start sharing my screen here. So at this point, hopefully everyone is uh, seeing the screen that says the future of the forest is in our hands. Uh, if you cannot see that, I would ask someone with the library staff to please let me know. But I'm assuming that you all are. So yes, uh, I can see that, Josh. Great, great. So uh, just a little note here, the, the center image is our main exhibit gallery. Uh, the image on the left uh, is a cone from a hemlock tree, and then the image on the right is a hemlock tree itself in maturity. Uh, so, you know, when, when I have that statement up there, the future of the forest is in our hands, sometimes that is quite literal uh, in terms of uh, a very small seed being able to grow and mature into a uh, a gigantic tree. The hemlock, in fact, is the state tree of Pennsylvania, as uh, some of you probably already know. I also on this slide have the mission statement of the museum. So the Pennsylvania Lumber Museum serves its diverse community by actively working to preserve and share the history of Pennsylvania's forests, inspiring our audience to become better stewards of Pennsylvania's forest resources and heritage. 
so other than in the name of the exhibit, we don't necessarily have lumber in the mission statement. Um, we're looking at it, it more holistically. So lumber comes from the forest. We're interpreting then all aspects of, of forest history, not just the production of lumber in Pennsylvania. But it is a very important part of what we do here at the museum. So uh, to move on to the next slide, I'm going to present a brief overview of the history of forests and lumber in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. So uh, with our exhibits, we basically look at the uh, scope of time uh, in terms of how human beings have used and interacted with Pennsylvania's forests over time. So we go back as far as the Native Americans. Um, you know, a lot of archaeological evidence would suggest that Native Americans have been in Pennsylvania for up to 20,000 years. So actually a much larger scale of time than the recorded history uh, of, of Pennsylvania, if you're you know, using that term prehistory before things were written down. Um, uh, so that's where we sort of begin our story. And the image in the upper left, uh, the sort of has the yellow cast to it, is uh, William Penn uh, meeting with some of the Native Americans here. Uh, Native Americans, you know, used and interacted with the forest in a, a very specific way. Uh, they relied upon it uh, for, you know, very much of their day to day existence, uh, but they were never here in population density uh, where their use of the forest pushed it past its ability to naturally regenerate. Uh, as William Penn establishes the European colony here and encourages people from Europe to move to Pennsylvania, uh, we start to get more and more folks using more and more of the forest. And eventually, as you'll see in the coming slides, we do push Pennsylvania's forest past the point of its ability to naturally regenerate and restore itself as a renewable resource, which is where uh, human uh, management and uh, uh, conservation come into play. So <clears throat> the name of our state, Pennsylvania, the Penn part is obviously William Penn. The Sylvania part is Latin for forests. And, um, you know, when William Penn got here, the estimates are that Pennsylvania was about 95% forest covered. Uh, the popular myth was that a squirrel could climb a tree along the banks of the Delaware River near Philadelphia and make it all the way to Lake Erie without having to touch the ground once, just hopping from branch to branch, tree to tree. And, uh, you know, that was likely very much the case that, you know, if squirrels could travel that far. Uh, <laughs> some of the other images on the screen here we have uh, a lot to do with water transportation of lumber. So early on in the colonies, uh, there wasn't a whole lot of transportation happening. Lumber industries were very localized. So a sawmill would spring up in a community. It would saw uh, lumber that was harvested from the forests around that community. And the lumber that was sawn would then go toward that community. It, wouldn't, it would stay essentially within a very small radius. As the industry grew, it gradually became a, you know, a national and international industry where our lumber was being used, you know, not just in the place where the tree was cut down, but all over the Commonwealth, all over the colonies, and then eventually the country, and, you know, all over the world. Some of our, our uh, white pine trees were sent uh, to Europe to be made into sailing ships. Uh, white pine is very tall and straight and is uh, easily manufactured into ship masts and other large parts of sailing vessels. So uh, the images here of the water transportation sort of uh, belie how that was done. You know, obviously you cut a tree down uh, in the forest, you've got to get it to where it can be manufactured into, you know, whatever you're uh, interested in turning it into, whether that be a ship mast or just, you know, boards for a house or furniture or what have you. So uh, the image on the upper right is a raft. That was one way of transporting logs from where they were harvested to where they were uh, manufactured. You uh, simply take all the timber, lash it together, and then the product becomes your conveyance. So you have folks there on the raft uh, using sweeps or you know uh, types of oars, and you just steer these large rafts down the major waterways in Pennsylvania, uh, primarily the Delaware River, the Susquehanna, and the Allegheny. Uh, the two images on the bottom uh, show log driving. 
So <clears throat> that's an alternative to building a raft is you just uh, dump all the logs into the river loose. And then much like a cowboy would drive cattle from the range to where they were, are uh, uh, being sold and processed, you're driving logs down the river from where they're harvested to where they are milled. Uh, the image in the bottom right, uh, you can see in the background, there are some vessels there that were called arcs. So the drive wasn't a passive process. They didn't just dump the logs into the river and say, see you later, hope you make it. Uh, <clears throat> there was a crew that would accompany the drive and make sure that uh, you know the logs were getting to where they needed to go. Any logs that rolled up onto the banks were put back into the river so they could be uh, continue on their way. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, image in the upper left here shows sort of the uh, maximum extent of that. That is a river that is completely filled with logs. Uh, and you have some folks out there, presumably that are going to break up a jam. So as the logs are flowing down the river, sometimes they get hung up. Uh, and in that instance, the men had to climb out on the log jam and break it loose. The other image in the upper right is construction of a splash dam. So splash dams were built to support that type of transportation. They would uh, dam tributary streams along the major waterways. And then as the drive was coming past where that tributary flows into the major waterway, they would open the splash dam and artificially inject more water uh, into the uh, water body to facilitate the logs continuing on down to where they need to go. And that was the image in the bottom right. Uh, that is a photograph of the log boom at Williamsport, Pennsylvania. Uh, you can kind of see the dark masses on the right hand side of that are the part of the infrastructure of the boom. Uh, there are wooden cribs that were sort of laced logs and then filled with rocks uh, with floating logs and chains sort of linking them. And essentially it created a giant net uh, in the river where the current would sort of push all of the logs coming downstream into this uh, net. And then again, you'd have uh, men that would go out and sort of sort them and get them to where they needed to go. So, uh, you know, with the boom at Williamsport, at one point there were as many as 30 sawmills operating in the town. And it was uh, because of that uh, part of Pennsylvania that became known as the lumber capital of the nation or depending who you talk to, sometimes the lumber capital of the world. Uh, the map in the lower left here shows uh, the extent of forest reserves about the time where uh, this type of major utilization of uh, logs and forest products is happening. So as other flatter and uh, more easterly parts of the state were settled and cleared for farming, uh, by the time we get to uh, post-industrial revolution, and uh, lumber demand really spikes. The area that is shaded gray there in the central and mountainous part of the state is where most of the lumber reserves were. And that's where the majority of lumber industry activities were happening uh, at that period of time. You can see Potter County there is kind of up in the northern part there. Uh, and uh, that is where the museum is located. Uh, Water transportation is great as long as you have timber resources located near to uh, bodies of water that are conducive to that type of transportation. Uh, to get to the more mountainous, harder to reach areas of Pennsylvania, uh, where streams are smaller, the uh, lumber industry needed a different type of transportation, and that is where railroading can, comes in. The image in the upper left is a Shea locomotive and a train full of log cars. Uh, the locomotive in the image is very similar to the one that we have in our collection. Uh, the image on the upper right is a Barnhart log loader. Again, another object we have in our collection and on display when you come to the museum. Uh, these two uh, mechanical inventions greatly revolutionized the lumber industry in terms of uh, you know, providing a reliable form of transportation and a much increased speed of uh, loading and capacity for getting logs from the forest to the market. Uh, the bottom two images, the one on the bottom left, uh, horses and manpower were still very much vital. Uh, you needed to get the trees from the upper parts of the hill slopes and mountains down to the valley bottom where the railways were, and that was accomplished with uh, teams of horses skidding them or just you know hooking up to the logs and pulling them down the mountain. <laughs> and then the uh, bottom right image is the actual felling of the timber. So men with axes, saws. Uh, you can also see some men there peeling bark from the tree, uh, which we will get to in just a little bit here. Uh, 
Uh, so all of that activity uh, by the 1870 puts Pennsylvania as national leader in total lumber production. Uh, so we are producing more lumber and lumber products than any other state in the US. By the end of the 1870s, we are supplanted by Michigan. And then eventually uh, today, fast forward to, to 2020, 21, Oregon and Washington state are typically national leaders. However, Pennsylvania is still national leader in hardwood lumber production. Again, something we'll, we'll dive into a little bit later in the presentation. So you can see uh, you know, all of the, the lumber being produced here at these various mill towns uh, in the upper two images on, on this slide. Uh, leather is the other piece, and that is something that uh, people don't necessarily always commonly associate with the Pennsylvania lumber industry or forest products. Uh, but you'll see the image in the lower left with the rail cars. That is all hemlock bark that is in the rail cars and stacked behind the men. Uh, hemlock bark and the hemlock tree is very rich in tannic acid. Uh, so tannic acid is the primary ingredient that a tannery uses to transform animal hides into leather. Uh, the, tanning, the tannins have a free uh, electron that binds with the protein molecules, stabilizing the proteins and preventing them from uh, decaying and disintegrating. So instead of, you know, once you have a, a side of animal hide, it doesn't just deteriorate and rot into nothing. It is uh, transformed into leather, which is then workable and usable for a whole variety of purposes. Uh, while Pennsylvania led the nation in lumber production by 1870, by the end of the 1890s, we led the world in leather production. So we were producing more leather than any other place in the world, and we held on to that for about 20 or 30 years. And that was all largely due to our, our hemlock trees. Again, the tree that eventually, because of its importance to Pennsylvania lumber industry, uh, was designated the state tree of Pennsylvania. All of that activity, uh, utilization of the forest, remember from the beginning, we, we are placing more and more demand on our forests. Uh, you know, when there was less demand, Native Americans might, you know, burn a section of the forest for hunting ground or harvest logs to be used for palisades for a village or buildings or what have you. Um, by the time they, you know, they were transitory, they would migrate to another place, do the same thing all over again. And when they got back to the place where they had done that initially, they found more forest. With more people and more demand from you know, industrialization and a worldwide market, we pushed our forest past the point of its ability to do that on its own. So we were left with widespread deforestation. Uh, that's the image in the upper left. Uh, fire was a major problem. Uh, there were whole swaths of Pennsylvania that were burning around the turn of the 20th century with uncontrolled wildfires. Without the trees to hold in soil, erosion was a major problem, which also affected our streams and waterways in a very detrimental way. That's the image on the bottom left. And wildlife habitat is the other. Uh, there were so many types of animal species that depended upon the forest for food and shelter. And when it was gone, uh, you know, our we lost our native wild elk population. Most of our large predatory animals went extinct, so mountain lions and wolves. Uh, you know, the, we have accounts of the early 20th century of hunters finding deer tracks in the snow and tracking them for three days just to be able to get a deer because they, the population of deer was pushed uh, to its limit, not just through uh, deforestation, but also through overhunting. Uh, so these were all very serious problems that the state faced, not just the industry, but regular citizens. And it was those people that uh, started to see that this was becoming a problem that uh, went to their legislator, legislators and advocated for solutions that caused the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania to have to step in and start to manage and restore the forest. Uh, the image in the upper left is Dr. Joseph Rothrock. He was uh, someone that was appointed by the state through the Department of Agriculture to conduct a survey of Pennsylvania's forest and lumber industry and come up with to solutions or proposed solutions to some of those problems that we talked about on the last slide. Uh, this is an early bulletin from what was then, you know, the legislature took uh, and Department of Agriculture took his report, liked what he had to say so much that they created a Department of Forestry within the Department of, or the uh, Bureau of Agriculture 
and uh, uh, put Dr. Rothrock as its first uh, head. Uh, so in the beginning, it was himself and one other employee that were responsible for forest management across the entirety of Pennsylvania. Uh, that soon grew with the creation of a forestry academy at Mount Alto and recruitment of professionally trained foresters, which uh, at that point in time, around the turn of the 20th century, was a very new profession. Uh, the image in the bottom left is uh, from a nursery where you know they were replanting and regrowing trees. Some of these were just test plots, so they were numbering trees to see how you know they would react to different conditions or different uh, treatments and uh, pests and and problems and that sort of thing. But a very concerted scientific effort on the part of the Commonwealth. Uh, the Commonwealth gets help from the federal government in this effort through the CCC. Uh, this is a depression era program, uh, you know, uh, during the, the stock market crash and then the following Great Depression, uh, up to a, a quarter of Pennsylvanians were out of work. When uh, Franklin Roosevelt gets elected, uh, he decides to put in a variety of these uh, works progress programs uh, where the federal government is paying people to do various jobs. One of those is the CCC or the Civilian Conservation Corps. Uh, you were eligible for the CCC if you were either a World War I veteran or if you were a young man between the ages of 18 and 25. Um, you would be given a place to live uh, in the form of a uh, usually hastily constructed camp, uh, three square meals a day, clothing to wear in the form of a uniform, and you were paid about a dollar a day, so $30 a month. Uh, 25 of that, the other qualification other than being 18 to 25 is you had to have a family at home. So 25 of the uh, dollars you earned during the course of the month were sent home to help support your family. You know, your, your father, mother or other relations might be out of work uh, because of the conditions of the depression. So this money goes to them to help them uh, support their day to day life. And in return, you are tasked with doing conservation work. Uh, so you can see in the bottom slide, they are, you know, uh, measuring and replanting trees. Uh, so far as conservation work, uh, the bottom right slide, construction of fire towers. So remember that other slide that out of control forest fires are a big problem as part of the, uh, you know, uh, not best practices of the lumber industry. So fire control is something that the state is very much concerned with and by extent, then uh, the Conservation Corps as well. Uh, it, in the end, there were about 200,000 men from Pennsylvania uh, that uh, participated in the program uh, and nationwide, the CCC planted over 3 billion trees uh, during the nine years that it existed uh, in the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, you can see the, the map in the upper left is a little hard to read, but each of those blue rectangles is a location of a CCC camp. Uh, there were 153 of them in total throughout the nine year course of the program. Uh, that's more than any other state except for California. And you can see they're not evenly distributed across the state. The majority of those blue rectangles are located right up in the north central part of Pennsylvania, which if you remember that map of where timber reserves were around the turn of the 20th century, basically the same area. So the uh, CCC was restoring those cut over timber lands uh, the state had ended up purchasing a lot of land up there to be able to manage it. Uh, lumber companies were not interested in hanging onto the land after the timber was cut. So the state would step in, sometimes buy it for uh, property tax value, but a very conscious decision to own the land to be able to uh, you know, restore it and have control over what happens during that restoration process and reforestation. Uh, with that public land, uh, there comes a realization that because it does belong to the public, uh, we should be able to allow citizens of the Commonwealth to make use of this property. So the other feature that's depicted on this map, the green pine trees and green text, are all state parks that now exist in Pennsylvania. Uh, CCC was very instrumental in uh, providing the infrastructure for those state parks. And again, you can see those are not evenly distributed either, uh, where there were a bunch of CCC camps up in the, the lumber country. There are also now a bunch of state parks. We can get to that on the map on this slide. So the upper left image, the green 
uh, light green, gray, and uh, orangish brown color are all publicly owned lands within the state of Pennsylvania. And again, not evenly distributed across the state. You can see that those publicly owned lands are very much concentrated in that north central part of the state where the timber reserves were, where the lumber industry was operating, where the CCC was sent to conserve, and now where we have a, a bunch of publicly owned state forest game lands, national forest, and uh, state parks. Uh, so the, uh, uh, I guess, long story short is through very conscious efforts at conservation and restoration, we are now uh, back up to about 60% forest cover in the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, around the turn of the 20th century, we had dropped down to maybe as little as 30%. Uh, that forest is a mixed use forest. So we are using it not only for conservation, for state parks and, and those types of things, we have a very robust lumber industry in Pennsylvania. I, I'm fond of saying that lumber history is not history in Pennsylvania, it's happening now and it's being made every day. And you can see the figures on the right uh, from the PA Hardwood Development Council are a little dated at this point. They're from a few years ago, uh, but still a very, very important industry to the Commonwealth. Uh, and uh, you know we have organizations like the SFI, that's the other image there, the Sustainable Forestry Initiative. Uh, the museum works very closely with their implementation committee. They do things like logger safety training, and certification programs to make sure that the uh, timber products that folks are buying are sustainably sourced. Uh, that means that we're trying not to repeat some of the short-sighted decisions that the lumber industry made uh, you know, about 100 years ago uh, so that we continue to have this resource available now and in the future uh, when we need it. Uh, it was very costly for lumber industry to sort of shut everything down and relocate to other areas of the country where there was uh, timber reserves once ours were depleted. And we don't want to repeat that. We want to make sure that, uh, you know, as an industry and as a resource for all of us in the Commonwealth, our forests are here to stay and well managed uh, for the foreseeable future. And that provides a lot, of, a lot of other opportunities, which is the image in the bottom of the cross country skiers. Um, it's not just industry, uh, you know, sawing boards and that sort of thing. Uh, there are a lot of other ancillary industries related to lumber. Uh, recreation is a, a great example. So those game lands, those state parks, state forests, a whole slew of activities that uh, we as citizens of the Commonwealth can do in, on those publicly owned lands. So that in a nutshell, you know, the, uh, the 15 minute version of uh, lumber history in the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, I'm gonna move into the actual specifics of the museum now. Uh, so this was an image of our visitor center that was taken a few years ago when we re had a really breathtaking and dramatic fall foliage season. Uh, the one this year was good, but didn't quite match this. Uh, so the visitor center building that's here now, uh, the core of it was built in uh, 1970, but we did go through a major renovation uh, between 2012 and 2015. Uh, they added, uh, you know, tens of thousands of square feet to the building, almost double the size of what was here before and then created an all new exhibit as well. So our core exhibit is called Challenges and Choices in Pennsylvania's Forests. And again, if I'm in an elevator with you and I only have 30 seconds to tell you what this exhibit is, is about, in, it's really about human beings and our interaction with trees and the forest over time and how that has changed. So the choices are, you know, most basic level, cut a tree down or leave a tree standing. The challenge is balancing those two needs. We can't do all of one or all of the other. We need trees for lumber, forest products, everything else, but we also need trees standing in the natural environment for wildlife habitat, uh, cleaning the soil, creating oxygen, all sorts of things. So we need to strike a balance. And uh, as I alluded to with some of my last slides, we are very much uh, in balance at this point in Pennsylvania. Most of our forests are certified well managed by the sustainable forestry implementation or sustainable sustainable forestry initiative and a variety of other non-governmental agencies that monitor forest health all over the world. Uh, so we've got a uh, model T in exhibit here, which I will uh, let you uh, explore, you know, when you come and find out why that is. Uh, this is our lobby area uh, with the tree cookie sculpture. Uh, in addition to the visitor center building, we have about 10 acres of campus 
with uh, 20 other buildings and exhibits that you can explore. Uh, so that is our Shea locomotive and our Barnhart log loader. If you remember the photos from the railroad transportation, uh, very much uh, exactly like a lot of the uh, pieces of equipment that are in those images. Oops, I went back instead of forward. Uh, other buildings, uh, those the, the Shea and the Barnhart are housed in a building that is part of our uh, recreated lumber camp exhibit. So we have a series of buildings that give the impression of what life was like for a Pennsylvania wood hick. That's somebody who's cutting down trees uh, in the northern part of the state around the turn of the 20th century. So some of those buildings include a stable and hay storage. That's the image in the upper left with the sled. Uh, horses, very much an important part of a lumber operation. Uh, Saul Filer Shack is the building, uh, the image in the lower left. Uh, Saul Filer was a specific profession in the lumber camp. And uh, as the name suggests, uh, they kept all of the saws in camp in good working order. Uh, that's all they did. There were typically two sets. Uh, one would stay in camp with the filer. He'd work on them during the day. When the woodcutters, wood hicks got back in the evening, they would swap out the shark set that he had just worked on for the set they were using the previous day. And that way they were always starting the day with a nice new sharp saw. Blacksmith shop, uh, you know, we will have uh, blacksmiths doing in-person demonstration from time to time. That's what this image is. Uh, blacksmith is Mr. Fixit in the lumber camp. These places are remote uh, in, you know, forested and largely unpopulated parts of the state. You can't just run out to the hardware store if something breaks. You need somebody at your camp who can make and repair tools. That's the blacksmith. Uh, the jobber's residence is the other image here in the lower right. That is the jobber's wife and daughter. So jobber is camp foreman. He is a person who's an experienced uh, woodcutter that will contract with the timber owner, the person that owns the land where the trees are, negotiate a, an area to cut for a specific price, and then move forward hiring a crew, uh, having equipment, uh, including the horses and saws, and then uh, conducting the cutting work. Uh, the jobber is unique because he was typically the only man in camp that would bring his wife and family along with them. And because of that, they often had a residence separate from the bunkhouse where the rest of the men slept. Uh, again, we, you know, as, as we are able, we like to have uh, people in these spaces interpreting in person these uh, various historic jobs and roles. And uh, that's what you're seeing there in that image. Uh, we have a laundry shed. Laundry was usually only on Sunday. That was your day off. So you could shave, play cards, read the newspaper, and wash your laundry. Uh, most men in a lumber camp typically had one change of clothes. So they would wear one pair, one shirt, one pair of underwear, and socks throughout the course of the week. On Sunday, they would take off the dirties and put on the cleans and then wash them. Uh, and we have several firsthand accounts where to a man, they said, we never, ever washed our pants. Uh, so imagine that the lower left image is the bunkhouse. Uh, our bunks are built to sleep three people to a bunk. And, you know, in, in ours, you'd probably have between 50 and 70 men up there. So you've got 50 to 70 guys that never wash their pants, all living in a relatively small and confined space. Uh, the mess hall and kitchen are really the heart of the camp. Those are the other two images. We have a table set for an evening meal. Uh, and just like a lot of the other buildings on our campus, we try and have uh, live uh, folks in these spaces interpreting the history and conducting demonstrations whenever possible. Our camp stove in the kitchen is a coal and or wood fired stove that is functional. And uh, whenever possible, we like to have uh, folks in there doing cooking demonstrations, which is what you see in the image. We have a steam powered sawmill on site. So that's the image on the lower right. Uh, steam coming out, uh, you know, the excess steam is vented into the pond. Uh, it's a circular sawmill, which you can see in the upper left image. Uh, very typical of what would have uh, been in operation in Pennsylvania shortly after the Civil War up until about the 1890s. Uh, by then, a different type of sawing technology comes into play. Uh, the image below that in the lower left is the engine room for the sawmill. So we have two different steam engines that provide all of the power to the equipment in the upper level of the mill. Uh, those are all both the upper level where the sawing is happening and the lower level are typically staffed by volunteers. We usually have about three or four folks 
down in the lower level uh, monitor, uh, running the boiler. The image in the upper right is our historic boiler. We actually have a more modern oil fired boiler that pr actually provides the steam. And then they make sure that the engines are running properly. The belts have enough tension. Uh, you know, there's enough steam, all that sort of thing. And then the Sawyer up above is uh, gauging, you know, each log for its best yield. Uh, most of the lumber that we saw, we do end up using on site for various product or projects. Uh, but when we have left some left over, we do will sell it to folks that are interested in buying it as a fundraiser for the museum. A couple other pieces of equipment down there. We have a shingle mill, bandsaw carriage, and birch still. So the upper two images are shingle shingle mill. Uh, there were a variety of these types of industries that took advantage of leftover timber that was too small to be sawed into dimensional lumber. So wooden shingles were, you know, you can see the building itself has wooden shingles on it there. Uh, they were a very popular roofing material in the state of Pennsylvania uh, around the time of the height of the lumber industry. You know, we're talking late uh, 19th, early 20th century. Uh, we have some volunteers there using an antique tractor to power uh, our shingle mill and cut shingles. Uh, when we run it, we also have a, a brand that has the logo of the museum on it that we can then stamp the shingles with and hand out as souvenirs to folks. So the people in the upper left there are uh, likely waiting for some of their shingles to take with them. Uh, the saw carriage is the lower right. Uh, that type of carriage is much larger than the one you saw in the photo of the active mill. Uh, that carriage was used in a bandsaw mill. So that was the next step of technology for sawmills. Uh, bandsaws were much larger, had a faster cus cutting capacity and could handle much larger logs, hence the larger carriage. Um, and then the lower left is our birch still exhibit. So extracting uh, essential oil from the bark of the black birch was an activity that was, you know, sort of related to lumber industry activities around the turn of the 20th century. Uh, it had a pharmaceutical purpose. So within the birch oil is contained a chemical called methyl silicolate, uh, and that is commonly known as spirits of wintergreen. So anything that was historically wintergreen flavored, like uh, Crest toothpaste, Scope mouthwash, Wrigley's chewing gum was flavored with birch oil. Uh, our still is a cord still. So there's a box that will hold one cord, which is, uh, you know, essentially four by eight by 12 feet of uh, uh, bundled uh, birch saplings. Saplings work better because they have a higher bark to mass ratio. Uh, you know, the more mature pieces, you have more of the, the wood in the center compared to the, the bark around the outside. With the saplings, there's much more bark, so we get more oil out of saplings than we do running big pieces. Uh, you light a fire underneath the still, fill the bottom with water, close it up, and you essentially pressure steam those black birch saplings over the course of 48 hours. So one cord of birch saplings will give us about one quart of birch oil after we're done. Um, the FDA considers it a controlled substance. If you were to drink the birch oil, it would thin your blood to the point where you would die. So we are not allowed to sell it. Uh, we do give it to a local soap maker and uh, she uses it to scent her soap, which we then sell in the gift shop of the museum. So we do find a practical purpose for it. Um, it was also an active ingredient in topical pain relievers like Ben Gay or Icy Hot. Anytime you smell that kind of winter greeny smell, Historically, that would have been birch oil extracted with a still just like this. In the 1950s, uh, chemical companies begin to be able to synthesize it. So they don't need uh, the, the wood hicks out there running birch stills like this anymore. They can just make it in a the lab. Therefore, you don't really see this type of industry very much anymore, uh, other than places like the Lumber Museum. Uh, moving on, we have a CCC log cabin. That's the image on the left along with our CCC worker statue. So I talked about the CCC program in terms of the history, the history of this building. Um, there was a CCC camp in Southeast Potter County. Uh, they were planning to create a facility that was going to be known as the Black Forest State Park. Uh, for a variety of reasons that never came into being. And these cabins that they had intended to be vacation rentals so if you were coming to the park with your family, you could stay in one of these cabins while you were visiting the park. Uh, they ended up turning into long-term leases for hunting camps. 
Uh, in the 1990s, zoning regulations changed in that part of the county. Uh, they were going to require fully functioning uh, sanitary systems instead of just outhouses, which are what were built with the cabins. Uh, the leaseholders for this cabin walked away from their lease and it was scheduled for demolition. Uh, the museum raised money to disassemble this cabin and relocate it to the museum as an example of the type of work and projects and architecture that the CCC was famous for. Uh, the statue came later. Uh, that is a recognition done by a group called the CCC Legacy Organization. Uh, there are currently over 70 of these identical statues all over the United States. Uh, the CCC Legacy Group's goal is to have at least one in every one of the lower 48 states. They're about 11 states shy from that goal at this point, but I am proud to say that Pennsylvania uh, has more of these statues than any other state currently. There are seven of them uh, at different places throughout Pennsylvania, uh, and they stand as, you know, again, recognition and memorial of the impact that the CCC had on our uh, natural world and uh, recreation infrastructure all across the country. In that, uh, there's another building close to the CCC cabin uh, that's the image in the upper right. Uh, the Brookville building talks exclusively about tanneries and leather production. Uh, that red and green engine that's in that building is a diesel engine that was used at a tannery in Elk County. It was a switch engine, so as uh, loads of bark came in via rail or loads of hides came in, it would sort of shunt those to various places around the tannery facility to where they needed to go. And then when the hides were ready to be sent out as leather, it would again shunt those rail cars and get them ready for transportation. Uh, that engine was fully restored by a museum volunteer. When it came in uh, in the early 2000s, it was a giant chunk of rust. And uh, now it is a, a beautiful centerpiece to that leather tanning exhibit. Uh, our newest portion uh, exhibit in that building is in the bottom right. And that is a, a not yet publicly available uh, but it is a 10 by 20 foot model train layout that was recently loaned to the museum. Uh, the folks that built this train layout designed the entirety of it to reflect Pennsylvania logging in the 1920s. And uh, they used specific locations within Pennsylvania uh, to model for the display. So the lumber mill that you are uh, looking at in the picture there and stacks of lumber in miniature is a, a pretty exact replica of the mill at Sheffield, Pennsylvania. Uh, there's a portion of the town of Laytonia in this. Uh, there's tanneries from you know different parts. It really represents all the different types of uh, forest and lumber products and industries in Pennsylvania. And once we get it, uh, some barriers put in place to keep people from touching will really be a great uh, addition to the exhibit because it, it encapsulates everything that we've talked about uh, throughout all the other exhibits up until this point in the tour when folks are working their way through the museum. Uh, our last exhibit and, and uh, prior to the train uh, display, our newest exhibit is the Bob and Dottie Weber cabin. Uh, so the Webbers built this cabin uh, in uh, the late 1950s. Uh, it was, it's less than 500 square feet, uh, no electricity, plumbing or running water, and they lived in that space about uh, five miles from the nearest paved road for more than 50 years. Uh, Bob Weber did work for PA DCNR. He was a forest maintenance foreman by the end of his career. Uh, he spent time in a fire tower. So that you know sort of aspect that we talked about of fire control and management uh, and had this very unique lifestyle. Uh, the Webbers, you would think living so far and remotely uh, would have been relatively isolated from the rest of humanity, but that was not at all the case. Uh, they were probably some of the fiercest and most vocal advocates for Pennsylvania's forests that you would be able to find in the state of PA. Uh, they impacted and touched the lives of so many people. Uh, Bob himself had built over 100 miles of hiking trail uh, and was really working in DCNR at a point in time where they're kind of building on uh, what the CCC had done to get people into the forest and utilize this publicly owned resource. So, um, you know, making sure that, that, that uh, you know, the edict that was put forward under Maurice Goddard's leadership of the agency that they would like to have a state park within 25 miles of every citizen of Pennsylvania. Uh, you know, making sure that the public realizes the importance of this resource, the forest, 
utilizes it to its fullest extent and is educated on how to care and care for it and manage it. And, and that's what the Webbers were all about. Uh, that's why uh, the groups that were advocating for the preservation of their home um, recommended that we at the Lumber Museum add it to our exhibits. And uh, so far, it has been a very beneficial uh, relationship builder between our agency and uh, PADCNR, the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. Uh, we could not have done this project without their help. And, uh, you know, it's still a very popular exhibit. It came in in 2018. But, um, you know, being closed for COVID notwithstanding, there's usually not a week that goes by that somebody doesn't come through the front door and the first question they ask is, which way to the Weber cabin? So uh, it's, it's great. And, you know, we, we're using it to talk about a variety of different things. Uh, one of the main ones is, you know, asking folks to look at their own lifestyles and ask how they might be able to live a more conservation-minded lifestyle. Um, you know, if Bob and Web Dottie Weber are able to live in this space uh, as it is for uh, 50 years, uh, what are they currently using in their lifestyle that they may be able to give up to live a smaller uh, lifestyle, uh, leave more for uh, shared use for the rest of us and for future generations? So it's, it's a, a wonderful exhibit and a wonderful addition to the museum. Uh, there are a variety of hiking trails and a sustainable forestry trail that originate from the site. If you want it to, uh, depending how adventurous you are, you could do a 5.6 mile loop that uh, takes you from the west side of the site around a mountain and back around to the east side. So you exit on the sustainable forestry trail, come back on the lumberman's trail, which you can see in the bottom left there. Uh, a lot of beautiful scenery along the way. Uh, the sustainable forestry trail is another great partnership with DCNR. Uh, one of their uh, service foresters is leading a group of school students on the sustainable forestry trail to educate them on modern forest management practices and what they can do to be better stewards of the forest. We have a variety of special events throughout the course of the year. Probably the, the best attended and best well known is our Bark Peelers Festival. That's the image in the upper left. Uh, that always happens in July around the 4th of July weekend. Uh, a variety of contests open to public participation. We've got uh, burling, so the two folks on the log, log rolling, uh, two-person cross-cut saw, and then a grease pole competition. Uh, you know, that event is, is the Disney World experience of the Lumber Museum. If you can visit during that time, I highly recommend it because there's the most happening, the most to see and do. Uh, some of our other events are very much more community-focused, so we have a Santa event. That's the upper right, a Halloween event down in the lower left where we tell spooky stories and let folks trick or treat. And we also do a variety of outreach programs. So that's one of our employees on the green in Wellsboro uh, participating in their citizen science day program, talking about lumbering the tools as simple machines. A great program that we've done a bunch of times. So uh, that is the Lumber Museum in a nutshell, an overview of the history and a discussion of, of what we're offering to our visitors. Uh, I, of course, will entertain questions, but at this point, we'll turn things back over to our uh, folks at the library to uh, be able to talk about some of the uh, resources that they'd like to share with you all. Thank you so much, Josh. It's, it's fascinating. Um, Michael and Kathy have put together a, a resource guide that I have linked in the chat. So if everybody um, wants to check that out and I'll turn it over to Kathy or Michael, whichever one wants to start first. Go ahead, Michael. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. I'll try to yeah. be quick. I'll try to be quick. Uh, so I put together put together uh, you know some highlights of our collection. You know, just like Joshua mentioned, you know, a lot of it doesn't have to do directly with lumber, but is about forestry, which of course is where lumber is derived. So uh, so here's some highlights from our collection. So we have different types of materials, forestry and lumbering topics, federal and state government publications, industry public. I think Michael is uh, frozen. Oh, there we go. Okay, 
this yeah, is another it throws depression. up a little bit. Yeah, yeah, I've been having problems with this burping a little bit. Okay. Uh, yeah. So this is uh this is a work projects administration. So this is another depression era series, and there's one on lumber, and it's you know it's geared more toward maybe children or but it also provides a simple overview for anyone else. So it shows it talks about lumber and the different parts of a tree, the bark, sapwood, heartwood, shows a lumberman there with an ax. Uh, making money off the woodlot, that's by a machinery company. And so there's a there's a, a period photo from the 1920s of lumbering somewhere in the country. Uh, this is this uh, Department of Agriculture. This seemed relevant to Pennsylvania, even though it's not directly about Pennsylvania. There's another. There's another item. If you can still hear me. Yes, go ahead, uh, Mike. D Department of Agriculture, different Department of Agriculture publications. This one in particular deals with white pine in Pennsylvania, hemlock and white pine. Uh, during World War One, prices of lumber, so the commodity of lumber. And here's about insects that might damage trees and orchard trees in Pennsylvania. This is an, a book about Philip Dewey, a Pennsylvania state official and lumberman. And there's some images there of lumbering in Cameron County. And this this book here, we have it because it's autographed by the authors and we have it in rare collections since it's a local history item with a short production run. But you know, Joshua mentioned Williamsport is the center of the lumbering industry in Pennsylvania. So this book has some images of the log boom on the Susquehanna near Williamsport. Then also in these lumber camps, there's a lot of folklore involved in that. These are, here's the lumberman's drinking song collected in Clinton County from 1900. And then different floods that happened in Pennsylvania had an impact on the lumber industry of uncontrolled uh, movement of logs down the rivers. So here, here was a, a legal sediment to determine you know, how companies could recover the logs, you know, if it was a finders versus keepers type of thing. And I think I didn't read I didn't read it, but I think it probably allowed the uh, lumber companies to salvage their logs anywhere along the river. I that was the gist I got from that. And this is a wonderful book that we have in our collection. So we have 13 of the 14 volumes. The 14th volume was published posthumously. The American Woods exhibited. On thin pieces of veneer of different trees in the United States. So this was very, this is one of our neatest items that we have. So that's all I have. I'll turn it back over to Kathy. Okay. Okay, so Michael, you have to stop sharing. Okay. Uh, Should be up at, Nicole, can you help him? Just hit the X next to leave. Yeah. There you go. There it is, there it is. Okay. So what I'm gonna show now is The actual yep, here we go.
So I believe what's coming up in the process is a LibGuide that uh, we've put together for more resources. Yes, hold on a minute. You want me to go ahead and share that? Yes, please, if you could. I'm having trouble. All right, here we go. OK, so you will see this is different guides that we have put together. Uh, Nicole, you're going to have to go down and click on the lumber industry one. Thank you. So you can see there's a lot of different and if you will. You can see there's a lot of different material that we have had. Stop, Nicole. Uh, I've also added the reforesting Pennsylvania's wasteland. That will take you right out to the particular document that Joshua was talking about. You can also, if you'll go down a little bit, Nicole, and see that there are a lot of things for children as well. These are about experiences that children have had both mostly in the north woods not specifically in pennsylvania lots of things for them and go up one more go up towards the top please nicole stop and if you go to digital resources in that tab and go down a little bit the one that i really liked was the tree search stop you can go to the tree search that will take you out to a DCNR site that you can look for information about your favorite trees. So lots of information available, not only in the rare collections library, but in the state library available to you electronically, not just about the lumbering industry, but about forest management and how to do that. So lots of different things available to you. So thanks so much for uh, looking at this and I'll throw it back to Ellen. Thank you, Kathy and Michael. Um, and thank you so much, Joshua, for um, sharing your site with us. I do wanna, if, if anybody has time and wants to stay to hear the questions answered, we can go through those quick. Um, I'm scrolling back here. Um, somebody asked if there were any records um, maintained by the state that show rosters of the men who lived in CCC camps. Um, Kathy mentioned um, the state or the federal government has some lists, but is there anything locally that the Lumber Museum has about the CCC camps? So uh, PA DCNR does maintain a web page that has a CCC database associated with it. Um, and it is searchable. Uh, it doesn't have an exhaustive list of information, but uh, it does have quite a bit of, of, of information available there. Um, I can, if I can pull it up while you're reading the next question, I will uh, drop the web address into the chat. Uh, the other thing you can do is National Archives um, mm -hmm. will process a request for information. Uh, oh, thanks, Michael. Uh, <laughs> the National Archives will requ process requests for information for folks from the CCC and the records that they have. Uh, there is a portal page for that under, you know, one of the National Archives web pages. Uh, that one does require a fee, but they require a certain amount of vital information from the, the person you want to research, uh, and then they will send you whatever records they have pertaining to that person's time in the CCC. Great. Um, so how how exactly was hemlock bark used in the tanning process? 
So the bark had to be peeled off of the tree. Um, you know, they would fall the tree. Uh, they would, uh, someone with an ax would come and they would cut rings around the tree four feet apart. And then they would cut a seam across the top with an ax. And then you use a type of tool called a spud, which is just, uh, you know, essentially a, a stick with a pointy end on it. And they would push that under the bark, pry the bark off into as big a piece as possible. They would uh, set it in the woods uh, rough side down and stack it up into piles, let it dry in the woods for a bit. And then they would use uh, wagons uh, to, or, you know, slides sometimes, you know, just like you would think of slide on a playground uh, to get it to the to the railroad, which would then transport it to the tannery. Uh, at the tannery, it would cure some more. So in a properly built bark stack, it could be there for up to 10 years. Uh, but usually they used it a lot quicker than that. It would go into a grinder uh, and they would just like coffee, grind it up into uh, smaller pieces. That would they would then inject uh, hot water, not too hot, right around between 60 and 70 degrees, uh, and other chemicals, and create a solution that they would call tan liquor. And then the hides would be submerged into that tan liquor. Uh, depending what grade of leather you want it, you might leave them in that liquor solution for several months at a time, maybe three or four months at a time. Uh, more sophisticated tanneries had mechanical agitators that would, you know, sort of roll the hides in this bath of tan liquor and make sure that each side was completely covered. Uh, when it came out, that uh, chemical process, that transformation was complete. You no longer had animal hide, you had leather. So um, the, the bark was very important for every one railroad car load of animal hides coming into the tannery. They needed three railroad car loads of tan bark. So that's why the leather industry was located here in Pennsylvania, where the hemlock trees were, as opposed to out in the med Midwest, where most of the animal hides were coming from. OK, George asks, when will the model railroad display be available for public viewing? We hope to have that available by spring of 2022. Awesome. Any other questions? Visitors here? I think I got all of them. Well, thank you so much again, Joshua. It was such an interesting time. And anybody out there, if you get a chance, go up there and visit the museum. It's fantastic. It's probably my favorite historic site. So thank you so much for doing this for us. Great. And it was a, a pleasure day. to be here. Yep. Thanks so much. I'm happy to answer questions on my own. If anyone would like to email me, I'm in the Commonwealth uh, address book. Great. Thank you.